this is presentation is about scriptless testing, a really exciting topic, I, I think. Uh, but let's start with a statement that we as a small team at ING uh, strongly believe in and that engineers like you are at the heart of IT innovation. And we want to hear your ideas on how to be more effective in your daily job or the challenges you face. Uh, well, we also understand that it's hard to be innovative and also do your daily job at the same time. So that's where we, our team comes in. Of course, we're not, you know, doing all the innovation that uh, your your um, uh, what's in your focus. But this picture of our team, and this was taken at the Christmas online Christmas event. Uh, as you know, ING also, um, yeah, all, most of the IT people were uh, working at home. So also the team events were uh, at home. It was really fun, great fun. Uh, we have five uh, fixed um, team members. That is Luna, uh, Lua Japing, uh, Kevin van der Vlis, Tim Soethout and Anna Monalachi and myself. And all of us have a strong engineering background with masters and PhDs in software engineering. Um, and if you look closely, you can uh, spot David uh, in the top left, while I'm uh, a bit squashed uh, at the bottom right. So, um, so what do we do? Well, we actually collaborate with uh, a lot of universities, um, Dutch universities uh, like TU Delft, Eindhoven, uh, Open University. And we also host uh, a lot of students uh, doing master projects with us. I will explain later uh, why we're doing that. And um, some of them were present in the previous slide, so I didn't uh, um, uh, pronounce all the names, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, every uh, six months we have a new set of <laughs> more or less students. So, uh, but we have a fixed team of five. Um, next to that, we also host IT class students. And these uh, are the, our next gen high potential IT uh, candidates uh, that we want to recruit, uh, recruit at ING. And one example of that is actually David who joined uh, uh, ING in June after he did a masters with us. So uh, we're very happy to have him. And of course, our team doesn't work in isolation as we collaborate with other teams and chapters at ING to collect and solve challenges. So, uh, sorry. Um, so actually, uh, people are really uh, happy, uh, you know, uh, uh, collaborating with us. Um, and we also like to collaborate with them, with them uh, as you can see in the quotes. Um, so now what's our way of working? Well, it all starts with collecting the challenges from squads uh, in ING. So we're very close to the squads. And then um, yeah, we look at potential innovative solutions and that can be uh, come from academia or uh, from industry, but we do a thorough literature study to see what's out there. And then if we find a solution, we are going to validate it with a, a proof of concept. Eh? And sometimes we build uh, uh, the book ourselves, or if it's too big a challenge, then we open the student assignment, and then the student can really work on a problem and uh, we get a result there. Um, and then we apply the POC in several pilots in different teams, different settings, because ING is a really big company, so you have to validate it in a different uh, configurations, uh, supported by chapter leads and team leads uh, to uh, validate our assumptions further. And after that, we present the results to management, and then it's up to management to decide whether to productize the initiative and maybe roll out a solution globally. But we're not a team that builds products. We uh, advise management uh, really, uh, yeah, look at at the challenge and 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 also present a business case. Like, okay, if we do this, we really uh, are more effective, more cost effective. So management is also interested, right, to reduce the cost. So. Um, now let's highlight one of our initiatives, which started out as a, 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 a um, 
European project funded by the EU, uh, European Union. And we're uh, part of that uh, big project. So a lot of um, different um, parties, universities, uh, corporates working together um, uh, in, a, in a big project. It's a EVE project. We're now in the, uh, we just finished the second year of this project. And this is actually how we uh, start looking at scripted testing. So uh, the start is, yeah, 2019, start of the European project. Uh, we set up a collaboration with the Open University on GUI-based testing using Testar. That's a tool that is um, developed by Open University. So we use their two to, to uh, validate um, yeah, the scripted testing at ING. So that was really nice. Um, we also did a dissemination on AI-based testing, uh, both inside ING and outside of ING. And uh, we then worked on uh, different uh, use cases, in particularly the ING flow uh, web components. This is a generic framework we use for complicated uh, user uh, journeys. Um, and um, yeah, during that, um, yeah, the, our engineers learned more possibilities on AI-based GUI testing or script testing. Additional result is while we were doing the use cases, uh, yeah, we were discussing how to make applications uh, better testable by these kind of tools because yeah, uh, you also want to, uh, you know, move your application towards a solution so your uh, app can be tested in a, in a more efficient way. So both, coming from both sides. Um, let's see. So why are we, yeah, interested in this? Well, if you look at uh, eh, software, well, it's all over the place, right? Software is eating the world. Or they also say machine learning is eating eating well. But yeah, there's a lot of money spent on software, but there's also a lot of money being lost. And that's because of low quality software, right? Uh, and what's even uh, worse, I would say, is that we also lose our customer trust by low quality software. So we're not the only ones, right? So um, if you look at here, I think it's a, a screenshot of Facebook. I think it's a mobile version. So I don't know about you, but it's a hard. I have a hard time understanding what's going on in in terms of uh, what are the prices and what are the titles. And I think on the left, it's an example of the um, um, Booking.com uh, app, which is also not a very good user experience, I would say. It's not blocking users, you know, it's not crashing, but it's also a bad user experience. So, um, so you, uh, there was this uh, question already, uh, do, you, uh, do you like GUI testing? So probably you already seen this uh, pyramid. Um, and of course, yeah, we use testing to keep a high standard and when we test, we want to validate the security, reliability, and the quality of our software, right? Um, and then we use three types of tests, typically. So we have the unit tests. And these tests are really to validate small isolated components. Uh, they're cheap, they're fast, and there are plenty of them. And then we have the surface tests. Um, that's actually where we validate the combination of components. So, and uh, they're less isolated, but still relatively, relatively cheap to create and maintain. And then we have the GUI test. And here we validate end to, the end-to-end -end result. Huh? That, that, that's touching all the components, all the, the software. And these tend to be expensive. Huh? These tests are expensive to create. They're also slower. And we also typically don't have many of them. That's why it's a pyramid, right? It's uh, less of them in the top of the pyramid. Uh, but yeah, our customers don't know about this pyramid. Eh? They only see the GUI. 
So uh, it's all happening in the in the GUI, yeah, end to end. Uh, so how do we make sure that everything works correctly when we have not that many GUI tests, right? We have them, but not that many. We would like to have more of them to get more, uh, yeah, assurance, right? That our app is really, uh, you know, creating this uh, nice user experience. So what do we do? We manually test. Um, yeah, that's not really scalable. Yeah, because manual tests are expensive, time consuming and non-repeatable. But don't underestimate the creativity of human testers to find issues. So at ING, we have a, a monthly break the app session where we all get in a room and we have a big, when we do a big release with lots of new uh, functionalities, we try to break the app. So we try to really, you know, uh, with, with our brains being smart, uh, try to break it. So typically, that's not something automated tests uh, catch these kind of uh, usability issues or accessibility issues. These yeah, the automated tests are created by engineer. And what's really nice about it, that they're repeatable and you can run them automatically. Uh, you get nice reports back when something is uh, not correct and then you can rerun. So uh, this is like the modern way to do GUI testing. Uh, but there's one big issue with this is that uh, testing is really expensive, whether it's, uh, you know, with testing scripts or manually. And it's actually estimated that 25% of the total IT budget is already spent on testing it's a big chunk. And that's because test scripts have to be developed, maintained, run frequently. If, uh, if you have lots of changes uh, coming uh, through the pipeline, you also have to update your test. So there's a lot of work and effort being spent there. Um, and why is that? Why is it so, um, you know, why are we spending so much time there? Because I think one of the issues is that Creating a good test script requires extensive domain knowledge. Uh, it also needs, hey, you need to know the application, you need to know the frameworks, you need to know the testing tool. So, um, so it requires highly qualified people, but also uh, domain knowledge. And what's also uh, a problem is that it's not really uh, mimicking and uh, these automated tests are not really mimicking the random behavior of users. Uh, because you're mostly testing the happy flows, but there are also many unhappy flows, hopefully not, but could be. Eh? So I think that are, is the, one of the key problems here, domain specific knowledge and maintaining that. So there we have it, scriptless GUI testing, finally. The solution to all your problems. No, not not really, but it will help a lot. Uh, it will reduce the number of uh, you know uh, script-based tests. It will um, catch more uh, issues uh, because it's exploring the whole application. It's clicking through all the possible uh, directions it can take. Um, so it doesn't really replace functional tests, but it complements it. Right, so it's not going to replace functional testing, but complement it. Um, keep that in mind. So you could use it for functional testing, but then um, it would require, uh, again, injecting domain knowledge into the monkey. And we call it also monkey testing, by the way. Um, and then of course you end up with in the same situation. So again, it will be more expensive to maintain. All right, what and how? So now let me show you an example of the tester tool, which with an extension, IG extension on top of it, clicking through a mortgage calculator. So here it is, a mortgage calculator. It's something you can do when you go to the IG website and when you're, uh, it's a bit squashed. Okay, fine. Um, and when you want to, I want to apply for a mortgage, 
you can already use uh, this mortgage calculator to calculate a possible uh, offering. So here you can already see uh, the monkey, I call it. Okay, it's, uh, scripted testing is a really big word. So the monkey is clicking through the application randomly. And what you can see that it, it has uh, a number of options. The green dots indicate all the options. And then it chooses randomly one of the options. It also has an option to put data into a uh, input field. And as you can see, without any knowledge, so the monkey is really, well, it's a bit smart, but not that smart. It's already able to click through the, uh, the mortgage calculator. And well, it's a big mortgage, 1.6 euro, but it's a big one. So another one, another round. Now I'm speeding up uh, the, the movie a bit. Um, and now it takes another direction because it has memory of what it did the first time. So now it will go try another scenario, a test case scenario in that sense. And as you can see, now it's, it's doing a, a different um, um, a user journey, so to speak. Um, and then, yeah, it's a bit more involved. Ah, to that, so, and then, well, you understand how it works. And then we do that like a hundred times. And then we try to catch software quality issues. So the monkey, so we, we know what's the software quality issue. Uh, but the monkey will just try and try and try, try to find it. Okay. Um, now this is a more involved uh, one. Uh, so the previous one was pretty basic, I would say. Uh, but this one is actually much more involved. Uh, this is a uh, COVID loan uh, application, which was uh, used by uh, Belgium uh, corporates to get a, uh, a loan because of COVID, they were not getting the, the revenue. So here they could apply for a Belgium um, uh, alone, but it's much more involved. So look, uh, there's like a lot of options. Uh, well, <laughs> a whole sheet of, uh, uh, you know, monthly uh, uh, revenue streams. Well, still the monkey is able to, you know, get through this one and really advance to the, to the next stage. Um, so that's a quick preview of uh, how, how, how Tesla or the monkey actually is being effectively uh, testing uh, a web application. So we use Tesla. So um, let's just explain a bit how it works. So on the one side, we have the system under test, which is an academic term for your application. And on the right, we have this Tesla tool, this open source Tesla. So what Tesla does, it first captures the state, which is the DOM, uh, uh, the complete DOM, also the shadow DOM, the whole, the whole state. And then it will take that state, uh, store it. It will then check whether that state has any uh, indication of, uh, of issues. So an issue could be there's some accessibility issue or there's some uh, errors in the, in, the, in the log of the browser. If there's no uh, failure, then it will uh, determine all the actionable elements. And then based on uh, some really smart algorithm, or you can choose which one, it will choose one of the possible uh, options. So this is where the AI uh, bit comes in. So we use Q learning. Uh, we use, um, I forgot uh, ex the exact name. I think it was, I don't know. I don't remember. No, it's, uh, I will come to that. But different AI um, uh, techniques to make this action selection smarter. Uh, because that's really, um, uh, yeah, where you need to, uh, where the monkey needs to be smart, because if it just does it randomly, it will uh, end uh, n uh, in in nowhere. It will just not advance. So here's the the bit of story. But still, it's um, it doesn't require any domain knowledge. So let's get into a bit of um, uh, theory here. So um, already uh, told you that. Uh, Tester captures the state, and this state we call concrete state. 
So it could be like the login page, which is like the whole DOM. We captured all the, the buttons and the positions and the colors and the whole, uh, the whole shebang. And then we have these multiple actions we can take. So if we take one of the actions, we end up in a new concrete state. And again, again, again. So these are all the possible options the monkey can take in terms of states. Um, and you could say that the state is actually the, the, uh, the, the GUI, uh, a snapshot of the GUI. Uh, but there's, um, and then if, of course, if we run tests are indefinitely for uh, like, like infinite uh, time, uh, we would catch eventually all the issues that are lurking in the application. But yeah, that's just not feasible uh, because then, yeah, we end up with this state space explosion, right? Like trillions of states. It's just, it's not uh, really, uh, it's not realistic, right? This, this picture. So what do we do to kind of reduce the number of states? Um, we have uh, this notion of abstract states. And what it does, it actually, an abstract state is actually a concrete state where you throw away all the details that are irrelevant, like the position or the color of an element. That's not relevant for the monkey to be effective. Um, so that's a bit of theory, but it's really crucial for the monkey to be able to abstract over the concrete uh, states and uh, look at the application in an abstract way. Uh, that means that uh, a number of yeah, uh, uh, concrete, uh, multiple concrete states are mapped to a single abstract state. That's kind of another way to uh, formulate this um, concrete abstract state notion. And now uh, we also have this component, this failure testing component, and the academic term for it is test oracle. And yeah, what it does, it just simply evaluates a abstract state to see if there's something uh, wrong in terms of software quality. And then a uh, tester will assign it a severity. So when it has severity lower than uh, 0 0.5, it will just continue, but it will, um, it will uh, report that in the final report that there's something, yeah, something is off, but it's not really fatal. And then we also have severity uh, 1.0 and then the monkey stops. It will just uh, say, this is really like, okay, uh, let's stop. It's really not making sense to continue. Now, of course, what I already uh, said that if you have like tester, the monkey just doing everything randomly, it will be stuck. Uh, it won't be very effective. Uh, and that's what we experienced at ING. We took the tester tool and applied it on different applications. And then it didn't really uh, work that well. So what we did is we built a rule lang language on top of it to make the monkey smarter. So it's again in this action selection tool, this brain like AI. Well, this is not AI, uh, but it's... Yeah, rule-based AI, you could say. Um, but of course, adding rules to monkey means, yeah, adding some knowledge eh, into the monkey. So it's really, um, really important that we add rules that don't uh, inject domain knowledge into the monkey. So it should be generic rules. So let's look at these rules. Um, we have three types of rules, action priority rules, we have input generator rules and we have Oracle verdict rules. Um, and now it gets, uh, oh, first a bit about uh, why we came up with these rules. So one of the things is that these rules should compose. Um, normally, if you look at test scripts, uh, if you take two uh, scripts, you cannot really compose the scripts. Uh, unless you make a reusable, uh, like a small uh, sub uh, um, user journey. But typically, 
test scripts don't compose. So that's really uh, something. So we should, okay, let's give it some knowledge, but this knowledge should really be composable. So that's a really uh, strong um, uh, property we want to uh, have for this solution. And it should also be flexible in the sense that it should address many use cases. Um, so we looked at some uh, rules and then probably if you're uh, building GUI uh, test scripts, you are already using CSS selectors or XPath um, selectors. Uh, we choose XPath XQuery as a, as a, a language, uh, but CSS selectors is also an option. We already exported, but it's, yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, we still need to do some work there. So um, now let's take an action priority rules and how they can be composed. Let's start with a simple uh, input form. Eh? So we have uh, a single text field. We have uh, uh, four options, exclusive, and one submit uh, field. So if you don't use any prioritization, the tester will just randomly choose uh, one of the six options. Uh, it also uh, doesn't really have a memory. So next time it will again uh, choose randomly one of the six options. Okay, but we already see that the Volvo has been selected. The option Volvo has been selected previously. So there's already some notion of something happened in the past. And we also see that the, the H field has a, a red uh, box around it. So uh, there's something wrong, it's invalid. So we have some rules, generic rules that says, well, if there's something invalid, you know, the text field or some other button, it's invalid. We raise the priority by a factor of three. So it's a multiplicative uh, priority. That means that the action the, the monkey will take will have a high, probably, a high probability to uh, retry entering data in, in, in the age field. Then we have the second uh, rule, and that's a bit more involved, but that's actually saying, hey, if I already clicked this um, thing once, I want to deprioritize the action. And if we look at number three, that's really a, a, a rule saying, uh, the options are not inclusive, but exclusive. It's either Volvo, either SAP, either Opel, and not equally probable. So when we apply these uh, rules, you already see that they're composing because multiple rules can be um, uh, applicable for a, uh, um, for a element. So if you look at the Volvo uh, element, you see that the second and the third rule are actually applicable. And that's why the, um, the priority is uh, one out of eight instead of one out of four. We also see the priority of your age being three and then the submit button is still one. So if we cal calculate uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, probability, you will see that um, when it randomly chooses an action, it will bias uh, the your age field to enter some new data there. So that's um, something we built on top of uh, Tester and it's really uh, effective. Uh, and we're still expanding on this. Um, we also have input generate rules. So for the input fields, uh, we have uh, regular expressions that are actually formulas that um, describe what should be the input. And, and if we apply it on this field, we see, uh, well, actually both rules are applicable. Uh, and if you apply it, you see that uh, in 30%, uh, 33% of the time, it will apply rule one. And uh, in 66% of the time, it will apply rule two. So there's still this randomness. It st can still put random data in, in a field that's not, uh, 
feasible, but we want that because it could well be that your application is not correctly um, uh, taking that into account and it can crash your application. So you could say this, this rule system is actually uh, a controlled um, um, randomness, um, but because we still want to be random, it's really important f to explore the whole application, but not too random. So it's a, a trade-off. And then we have the Oracle verdict rules, uh, where we uh, capture um, uh, possible issues. So here, the first rule is actually looking at the log, the browser log to see if there are any severe log messages. And the other rule is just matching statements, error statements in a page. But we are not stopping it, but we think it's suspicious then, right? But uh, the first one really stops the uh, sequence. Okay, a bit about the architecture. So we have the tester core layer, we have the ING generic layer and the specific layer, and they're all composable. Um, so uh, we leverage the, uh, oh, genetic algorithm. There it is, the AI technique. Uh, and reinforcement learning uh, components that are provided by Teststar. Then we build a generic layer on top of it uh, that is really um, targeted towards standardized components. And then we have the ING specific layer that's really the, on a use case uh, level uh, specifically. So that's our architecture. And it's really from going from generic to a bit more specific, but still uh, we want to have this low maintenance, right? Uh, so we put some additional rules uh, when we go to the specific layer, but it should be very generic. So we have this low maintenance. Okay, lessons learned. Uh, so we started using this uh, proof of concept uh, tester and then the ING um, extension on top of it. Oh, sorry. So we uh, tried five uh, pilots, uh, three uh, of which we finished. Um, and we found software quality issues uh, during all pilots, uh, soft errors more or less, not really big ones, but yeah, uh, like uh, things are uh, vis uh, visually not correct or accessibility issues. Uh, and indeed, the rule configuration uh, required low maintenance. So when we did a new release of the web, web app, uh, we didn't have to change the, the rule configuration at all. So, um, so that's also a good sign. We still have challenges to be addressed, of course. Um, the tool is built uh, with, uh, on, uh, with, uh, in Java. So it runs on the Java virtual machine, while the um, ecosystem of web development is Node.js. So that's a bit of a challenge to um, uh, integrate them. Uh, but we have some ideas to alleviate that. Uh, go fast or slow. Uh, of course, we want the monkey to be as fast as possible, but uh, not too fast because sometimes the GUI is still waiting or so to uh, detect uh, whether the GUI is stable or not is really uh, a challenge still. We have some ideas there, but it's a challenge uh, to do that generically. And we also have, um, let me check. Uh, yeah, performance issues. So if there are a lot of widgets, like infinite scroll pages, then uh, Tester is also not uh, really working that well with huge uh, amount of widgets. And what about mobile? Um, yeah, you can also use it for mobile. So we did uh, a master thesis project. Um, uh, it was Torn Janssen. He uh, graduated cum laude on that. So that was really great uh, to uh, test. Uh, doesn't provide it out of the box. And uh, David actually continued with that, uh, with the uh, work of um, Torn. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, related to a scriptless um, testing uh, on mobile, uh, David can uh, probably answer them. Uh, so here's um, a small um, yeah movie again, but then um, it's the ING mobile app 
it's uh, not the production app. It's uh, running in a test environment. So the PIM code is uh, 11111. So it's, uh, it's fake data. But uh, yeah, the same, um, the same approach also applies uh, for mobile. But of course, you have some differences also. Hey, you have swipe, you have different gestures you don't have on the web. So that uh, makes it a bit different. You also have a smaller um, uh, screen. Uh, so it means you have to scroll more. So scrolling is also uh, uh, more uh, yeah, important to incorporate that. But again, you can see that the monkey is also, uh, tester is also effective here. So that's another extension we built at Angie. It's still a proof of concept, but we're advancing. Um, and we're getting there uh, uh, because also of David's work. So uh, thank you for that, David. Uh, David. Um, so what did we learn there? We did a mobile app experiment and we used a code coverage metric. Uh, so what we did, we took the script-based tests we currently have and we measured the code coverage which was 45, 44%. And then we used the uh, scriptless solution and then we measured the code coverage and we end up with 41%. And interesting enough, uh, if you combine both, you get a higher coverage. So that's really uh, one, uh, the getaway is that scriptless testing is not going to replace your script-based test, but maybe a part of it. So where they overlap, I would say go for the scriptless solution because it's cheaper. Uh, that's the takeaway message. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, of course, mobile is different. So um, Android and iOS, really different platforms. Uh, we try to um, make it like one solution for both, but it's really hard to do that. So we decided to do an Android track and an iOS track really disconnected. Um, state identification, so abstraction, state abstraction is also a bit more difficult in the uh, mobile um, uh, compared to uh, web. Um, yeah, and it also, uh, I would say that uh, the tooling is less uh, mature in the, in the mobile uh, uh, for mobile than for web. And I want to summarize is it's all about trade-offs. So uh, it's all about engineering. So if you have a, a monkey that is really stupid and just clicks around, it will do it doesn't really cover much of your uh, application. But if you inject a bit of knowledge into the monkey, generic knowledge, then it will be much more effective. It will cover a lot of your application uh, and while still being low maintenance. And this is the end of my uh, presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.